I, I would get that kind of criticism sometimes from like MAGA people or from conservatives where they, where they didn't like a column I wrote, an article I reported on. They'd be like, how does this help Republicans get elected? And I'm like, oh, I get that all the time. They, 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 exactly those words, in fact. I was at, a, at an event uh, that was a book event of mine um, a couple of years ago in a very affluent neighborhood in older crowd, people who were National Review subscribers. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, the first question out of the box was, how does any of this help Republicans win elections? What are you doing to help ensure Republican majority? And I said, nothing. I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I do. I'm not a political organizer. I'm not a campaign manager. I often disagree with these people on a lot of things. Um, you know, what I do for a living is I'm a, I'm a writer. I write opinion columns and sometimes I do some, some real journalism, go out into the world and do some reporting. And I try to tell people what I see and what I discover and what it seems to me. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of people who just can't understand that. And, or a lot of people who can understand it, but they pretend not to understand it because understanding it's inconsistent with their business model. You know, if you're, uh, particularly if you're on talk radio or you're on cable news, you know, you essentially have to act like a, uh, an extension of the Republican party and an extension of whoever's campaign currently is running for president in the Republican party. Uh, because commercially those shows just don't work without that. And they also don't work without the, um, this election is the last election in American history if we lose, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's the end. It's either we win or the country's over. And uh, this stuff is just um, words you don't say on a family podcast, but um, we all know what it is and it's dishonest and it's silly and it's bad for the country. And one of the things that I think is particularly galling about this is these people who sort of trademark patriot. You know, we are the patriots. Uh, we have radio shows on a serious patriot XM um, that really sell out the actual interests of the country and do things that they know are bad for the country and for its political system because it's a good way to make money. And um, and you can make a ton of money doing that stuff. You know, Sean Hannity is seriously rich. He is rock star rich. Um, you know, there's, there, he is not flying coach or, you know, flying commercial there. There's really good money to be had in that. I didn't, I didn't know there were that many doggy vitamin buyers out there, but I guess there are. And, um, it's a heck of a racket, but it's bad for the country. It's bad for the conservative movement too. And it's bad for ultimately the things that we, we stand for and want to try to accomplish in the world and in the country. Yeah. And I, I guess I, I, that is an interesting kind of rabbit hole to go down because, um, I read you, I read Charlie, I read a lot of National Review. I, I, I have kind of disparate people I follow in the conservative movement. But a lot of times it kind of does feel if you're somebody who is more on the libertarian side or not on the Trump train, not a populist, uh, like just embracing nihilism, like everything's going the wrong direction. Uh, but is it, are there positive signs that you see or, or is it really just, just not good news on the right right now? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the right's You've got a problem right now. Um, and it's had a problem for a while. Um, you know, Trump, um, Trump is an interesting phenomenon for two reasons. One was that he had really only one political insight in his life, but it was a really, really good one, which was that if you run the Ross Perot campaign inside the Republican Party rather than as a third party candidate, you have a pretty good chance of winning, uh, which he did partly because he's lucky because Hillary Clinton was an incompetent candidate. Um, but the other interesting thing about Trump is that he's not from the world of politics. He's from the world of celebrity uh, and from the world of real celebrity. You know, he's not someone who was Fox News famous. Um, you know, he's someone whose, uh, you know, name for years was a, was a shout out in rap songs. Um, you know, he's reality television famous, which in America is real famous. And celebrity culture is a lot more powerful than the political conversation. As much as we political people like to tell ourselves that, the conversations we're having among ourselves or what's really important going on in the country, they're not. Uh, one of the most um, encouraging things I ever saw, it's, it's been a few years now, um, and you'll know this because the name's on it, but it was, um, it was a poll that someone took of uh, various political pundits, you know, and what are your attitudes about these people? Do you trust them? Do you think well of them? Yada, yada, yada. You know, it was, you can tell it was old because Keith Olbermann was on the list. Um, so it's been a while since Keith Olbermann's mattered. But with the exception of, of Rush Limbaugh, the most common answer for every personality they asked about was never heard of them. Never heard of them. Uh, you know, people like us 
have really strong opinions about, I don't know, Rachel Maddow or, or Hannity or, or whoever. Most people in America don't know who these people are. Uh, most Americans- you know, the most famous ones. No, most most Americans could not pick Sean Hannity out of a police lineup. Um, assuming that you put in some other, you know, kind of Long Island guys who were, you know, sort of similar in some ways. So I think, you know, our political culture is is messed up and the rights, politics and culture and economic incentives are in a really bad place. The country at large, I think, muddles on pretty well. You know, one of the things that always drives me nuts about all this, you know, carnage rhetoric and the country is suffering and it's terrible out there and it's and it's all about to end. Have you ever been to America? Do you drive around? Uh, you know, our cities look pretty good for the most part. Um, our, our farms look pretty good for the most part. The countryside looks pretty good. The economy's doing pretty well. I mean, we've just gone through this horrible, um, one of the few literally unprecedented or really nearly unprecedented things that we, we've seen in our history. And the economy's bounced back from it just fine. Um, something like 80% of people say that they are either uh, financially better off today or in the same position as they were before the uh, epidemic started and all the shutdowns and all that stuff. That's amazing. That is, you know, some really great flexibility. And we do all sorts of cool stuff in the country still. We invent all sorts of neat things. We all have sorts of cool businesses. Um, you know, when someone sends people to Mars, it's going to be some guy in Texas probably launching a privately <laughs> funded lock rocket. And uh, so that stuff's all great. There's a lot of cool stuff that happens in America, but we've got a um, we've got a terrible government and terrible political culture. And unfortunately, I think a lot of organized conservatism in the Republican Party is contributing to what's not good in that political culture rather than trying to act as a corrective to it. How would you fix it? Or, or is there a breaking point where it falls apart and then something new emerges? Yeah, these things are not fixable because you can't manage a culture. Um, you can try to influence it. You can, you know, write books and have arguments and try to make people understand things and give people points of view. But cultures just go where they go. It's like fashion. You know, it's not um, it's not predictable. You can't. Uh, you can't say 10 years from now that, well, why are people going to like, you know, big yellow fluffy hoodie sweatshirts to make them look like Big Bird? I don't know, but people may like it one of these days. Who knows? Um, these things are, are you know, um, difficult to imagine. And they're difficult to predict. So anyone who's, this is one of the things we particularly do on the right is this wishful thinking that if only the schools weren't so biased, if only the media weren't so biased, um, if only we had some sort of effective propaganda network, then um, our ideas would flourish and the country would be better. We, we tell ourselves that story all the time, and I just don't think it's true. Um, conservative ideas have never been particularly popular because they are difficult and they force us to face unpleasant realities about things like scarcity. Um, they force us to face the unpleasant reality that there are lots of things in your life that may not be your fault, that are still your problem, uh, that you're the only person who can deal with them, even though it's not fair and uh, you didn't get yourself necessarily into that situation. Um, no one wants to hear that. They want to hear, give me a check. You know, I'm going to forgive your student loans and, and that sort of thing. So we've always got an uphill battle because we are telling unpopular truths that people don't want to, uh, don't want to hear. Uh, and this isn't a matter of, well, if the New York Times were on our side, it'd be different. I mean, yeah, it would be different if the media were different. It would be different if the schools were, were different, but it wouldn't be that different um, because we've got all sorts of propaganda channels. We've got Fox News and stuff like that. And um, it's not really moving the needle very much culturally, I don't think, because it's not that people don't hear what conservatives have to say. Um, it's that they mostly don't care or that they uh, reject it. Yeah, I mean... It's not what I want, but it, it, it is it is true. I guess one thing I want to yeah, pick up. I could interrupt for just one second. Oh, yeah, yeah. It comes into my head. Um, this goes back to the original point of our conversation, which is that you hear from people sometimes, well, if people reject your ideas and your ideas must be bad because we're a democracy and what the people choose must be good. And uh, conservatives really have to get past that. And this current you know mode of populism is not going to serve us very well. Uh, conservatives have to um, face the fact that um, they are never going to be the uh, the people's party. 
Um, and if they become the People's Party, they won't be conservatives anymore. They'll be something else. They'll be you know right wing populists or whatever it is the Republican Party is, is slowly being turned into. Uh, the people very often are wrong about things. That's why you need a government. If people were just you know in their masses um, happy and quiet and peaceful and productive, you wouldn't need a government at all. Um, we have states because people aren't like that and uh, because they need to be governed. Well, uh, so I want to ask you, though, because it does seem to me increasingly like the traditional definition of conservatism, right? The, the fusionism, fiscal conservatism with social conservatism and aggressive foreign policy or however you define traditional conservatism. At least mm -hmm. at one point there was a definition. But now I increasingly feel like conservative is becoming a meaningless word. If anything that can be used to describe both Breitbart and National Review yeah. and Rand Paul and Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley. Now, I'm not saying they all are or aren't, but they are all used that label. Sure. Guess, and then there's like this nascent war over what does it even mean to be a conservative with people that seemingly agree on nothing, all claiming the mantle. So I just want to get your thoughts on all that. Yeah, well, yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the... Irish Catholic Protestant thing here is, is is a good example again for this reason because you had a situation in which um, most of the people who described themselves as Catholics weren't people who you know went to mass or things like that. They weren't really active in that sense. They weren't really theologically or philosophically um, Catholic. They were people who were culturally Catholic. They were from Catholic families, Catholic neighborhoods, and it was a matter of affiliation, not a matter of belief. And that's really where our, our, our political camps are. They're matters of affiliation, not matters of belief. So we get, you get instrumentalist coalitions and the Democrats have always been better at that than the Republicans are of building coalitions of, of shared interests. Um, but even those are really starting to fade in some ways for in favor of coalitions of uh, shared hierarchies of social preferences and identity. And um, I don't see anything in the culture that suggests to me that that's going to change anytime in the near future. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 20 years down the road, we have, um, you know, some much more explicit version of the kind of cultural identity we have now, where you've got Republican businesses and Democrat businesses and Republican churches and Democrat churches and Republican neighborhoods and Democrat neighborhoods and a Republican brands and Democrat brands and that sort of thing, Republican books, um, where essentially everything is to some extent divided on the Fox News versus MSNBC model. And I don't think it's going to be very good for the country. I think it's going to have a real um, deadening and coarsening effect on, on the culture and on art and other things and on literature in particular. But um, it feels to me like that's, that's where things are headed.